Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Matan Hazanov. As you know, on my channel, I like to focus on interesting people with unique stories, entrepreneurs who have built great businesses, people that have failed and came back from failure and did something great. And today we have a very special guest, Jonathan Schiff. Jonathan is an entrepreneur, a tech entrepreneur that built a very interesting business, but his story is pretty unique and interesting because not only did he build his business, but it failed at some point and he revived it and now it's growing and doing incredible things. Jonathan is also a family office investor, which is something uh, which I don't typically come across, uh, entrepreneur, family office investor, and also he'll share some interesting insights into the crypto industry, which he uh, got into a few years ago and thinks is going very, very interesting places. So, Jonathan, good to see you. Thank you for having me. So take us back. What, tell us about your background, how you got into being an entrepreneur, all that fun stuff. Sure. I mean, it's, um, it's a bit of a family thing. Um, my father, going back to my father, he, um, he was actually one of the earliest investors in Microsoft, so, oh, wow. <laughs> which is uh, pretty interesting. Um, he was a student at U of T, and uh, he had to do a thesis on uh, nuclear, um, nuclear control programming. And they sent him down to Seattle to deliver his thesis. And while he was down there, he met um, a bunch of people and he heard about Microsoft. So my father came back home and he was a computer science guy, um, computer science engineer. Um, he came back and he actually made an investment in Microsoft um, years ago. So like the 80s or 90s? This is like 80s. Okay, cool. Yeah. Wow. So... Um, so, yeah, so, you know, we've always had in our family a culture of, like, tech is very important. Tech grows, you know, to, you know. Scales are crazy. Scales like yeah. crazy. Very few things succeed. You really have to be in the right network to figure out what's working. It's kind of winner takes all. There were a lot of lessons that were kind of, you know, taught to me from a very early age. And I tried to, you know, integrate them into into my own life. Um so that was kind of how it started. But actually, I went into the music business initially. So, you know, my first thing I ever did was music. Um, I was an artist. I put stuff up and uh, I put stuff on SoundCloud. I don't know if you remember okay. the SoundCloud yeah, days. Sure, sure. Um, and I actually got signed by a label in Atlanta. I was working with, you know, big artists like Rich Homie Kwan, who, you know, unfortunately just passed away. Uh, but that was kind of the first thing I did. Maybe I, we'll do the intro music or after music here. <laughs> <laughs> what play, kind of music? What play kind of some music Rich Homie Kwan right now. Yeah. Um, I was kind of like, uh, I was beginning to be branded as a bit of like a John Mayer type of personality. I played piano, didn't play guitar, um, but we made good music. You know, I mean, I, I put out one That's song on SoundCloud, <laughs> got a quarter of a million plays, you oh, know, wow, like okay. these were, you know, these were good songs. It was a good label. Um you know, we were kind of on that path, but it was kind of weird. At the same time, I was writing my GMAT, <laughs> okay. which is for business school. I was kind of doing both. Um, I did eventually leave that world, um, and I went to a school called Cornell Tech, which is in uh, New York City, and it's an amazing, amazing program, uh, which is kind of a hybrid program. So you're ha spending half your time in um in cornell university which is upstate new york and i was in the johnson school of business so you're with you know one of the best business schools in america you're with some of the brightest people and you're really learning like you know this is like serious finance serious economics stuff like that um and then you switch and halfway through the program you move to new york city and you spend your time in uh in a classroom basically on top of the Google building in Chelsea. Now they're in Roosevelt Island. Uh, and you're with computer science people. And you're doing a lot of classes together with them. And they're really teaching you like, you know, the nitty gritties of what it's like to work in a large tech corporation. Or if you want to go start your own company and you want to raise funding or, you know, stuff like that, they're really teaching you kind of how it works. And you're interacting with a lot of VCs. So when I graduated, I was like, you know what, let's try this startup thing. You know, mm -hmm. everyone's, you hear so much about it. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Let's, yeah. let's go build a billion-dollar business. Let's give it a <laughs> shot, you know. Uh, that was really the extent of the thinking. And uh, these were like the Trump years. You know, this was when Trump was uh, running for president the first time. And it was a lot of drama, I noticed, around news and fake news and this and that. And 
I remember uh, Facebook was trying to get into the news business mm-hmm. and people were pushing back. They were saying like, so there was a lot about news. Um, so I, I decided, I'm like, okay, I'm going to try a, try a news app, you know, yeah, like okay, a news so. aggregator. Um, so I teamed up with a guy in Brooklyn. Um, his name was Brian, great programmer, good guy. And we just started building and we built paper, which is, you know, our app. Um, and we launched it. It took us about a year to get out the door. It took a, took a good amount of time. Um, I moved back to Toronto in between all of this and we launched it and, um, yeah, it did well. It made it to number eight on the app store. So what was the insight you had? What did, what did the, what did, there's so many media companies out there. Yeah. It's, it's almost, it's so overwhelming the amount of information that's also organized. So what was unique insight? What did you do that was new or unique in the market? Yeah. So you know, I, I try to approach things from a, an emotional perspective and I have, I have a lot of memories of being a kid and, uh, coming downstairs before school and going into the kitchen and there would be a computer in our kitchen and my mother would be on it and she would always be switching between, um, like one newspaper and another. She wanted to be on two websites. There were two websites that were very important or two news websites one was Canadian and one was, uh, you know, news in, I have a grandmother who was living in Israel. Um, so my mother was, you know, on top of, you know, what was going on in Israel all the time, but she also needed her Canadian stuff. So I just have this memory of her switching between those two tabs, like constantly. And I was like, okay, I think we need something on our phones, which allows us to basically do that, which is basically just go from one front page to another you know, in a very nice, clean, simple UX. That was really the initial idea. And from a business perspective, um, I've, I remember like the days of, you know, I was born in, you know, 91. So I remember the days of like really good journalism and really good, you know, editorial stuff. Like there I remember, such a time. <laughs> yeah, I remember like wow. the 2000s magazines were at the top of their game the images, the ads, the the writing. I mean, it was just really beautiful stuff. You could pick up any magazine and it was like artful. You know, you could pick up a Wired magazine, pick up a fashion magazine, you could pick up whatever it was. And it was really perfection. Like, I really believe that some of the greatest creatives of that era were actually working in magazines and newspapers and stuff like that. So I I had this idea that the world was going down this route of like Facebook ads and Google ads and all that type of stuff. But I wanted to go old school. So I wanted to bring back, you know, these beautiful full page image ad images, kind of reminiscent of like an ad in the middle of Vogue or something like that. And I wanted to interstitch those type of ads, very high quality um, within the app. And I thought it would fit nicely because if you have very high quality publishers, if you put very high quality ads in between, um, I thought it would make a very nice user experience. So that was mm-hmm. kind of the approach. Yeah. So we're going to avoid making the joke that another Jew's trying to distribute <laughs> media in, the, <laughs> in, in North America. But right. um, so what happened with the business? Yeah. So, um, so like I said, I was working with Brian uh, in New York and I moved back to Toronto and I left working with Brian and all of a sudden I was in Toronto and Toronto is a very different beast. It's a very different city. Uh, it's not the center of media. It's not the center of creativity. Like, I'm sorry, Toronto. It's not, we got, you know, Drake and stuff like that, but it's a different beast. And, um, I didn't have my support network around me of VCs, um, developers, media companies, and advertisers. Like there's a lot of people required to make this work. Um, and to make it more difficult for myself, I decided to start working with a bunch of um, developers in Ukraine. <laughs> and this is before the war started. And I was working at nights. So it was basically just me managing this app, which had thousands of downloads. I'm not technical, so I didn't understand you know, if this was easy what I was doing or difficult because I didn't understand the technicalities of what was really going on under the hood. But it originally, initially blew up, right? The, the app, so it blew up, viral. but like yeah. it, it was literally a one man show and I would go on the, you know, on the administrative platform and I would, I remember there'd be a map. Uh, we, we built a map 
and I could see like pings when people would go on the app. And there were like thousands of these pings all over the world. And it was just me. Like it was literally, it was just mm-hmm. me. And then I would have, you know, some developers in Ukraine who, you know, all I was doing was just paying them. But if I didn't tell them what to do very clearly and very explicitly, they weren't going to help me. Like if the app crashed, it's not like working with a team where, you know, the team's like, oh my God, the app just crashed. Let me solve this. I would literally have to like go on Slack and be like, the app crashed. Can you fix it? Right? Like that's not a team environment. So it was very stressful. And, um, and then on top of it, the war was breaking out at this time. So, you know, this was a lot of drama kind of that was going on. And also I had to work at nights because, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, their 9 a.m. was my 2 a.m. And the app wasn't making money, to be honest. We just had users. We had tons of users, but it was not making money. We did not have the ad platform built out. So I... um, Why didn't you go out and like raise venture capital or try to... You know, go that route of like a typical, let's go raise, a, you know, $5 million or whatever. Right. So this is kind of where my father comes into the picture. So my father, like I mentioned before, you know, an early Microsoft investor, he said he would, um, you know, as a very kind gesture, he, you know, he said, look, we do venture capital in our family office. We'll give you uh, money to start this, mm-hmm. um, which was like a very nice notion. And I definitely appreciate it. I think what what happened though was when you work with a venture capital capitalist, you have to perform and you have to deliver. You know, so number one, there's accountability to someone who's not whoa, a family whoa, member. Whoa, accountability when you take VC money. By the way, founders, <laughs> this is if you take any lesson from this, whatever you're watching, accountability once you take venture capital and money. That is 100 percent true. Yes, <laughs> uh, it's very serious. Like, um, you know, if you, if you take capital, you know, we all know that that's just how life works. Um, the second thing is venture capitalists give you a lot of money. They don't give you a little money. They are, they're actually quite generous. When you work with a proper VC, they're not usually writing you checks for 100K right. or 200K. It's not worth their time. It's not worth their time. They're usually giving you quite a bit right at the beginning. And that allows you to build a proper team. And I think the biggest advantage you get when you work with like a real VC is you can hire, you could afford to hire a local team. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you try to kind of go, you know, maybe like the family route, you're going to have to hire overseas developers because they're cheaper. Um, and you don't have to pay rent for an office. And, you know, it's just, you know, it's just easier. So um, I'm not saying it can't be done, but I think if you want a nice, easy route and you want a nice environment where you come into an office and you work with a you know, group of people and, you know, you collaborate and you can talk in person – uh, I would say traditional VC is a good way to go because mm-hmm. I think it sets up a stronger foundation. You could do it my way, <laughs> but I think it's very, very difficult. Um, maybe if you're more technical, you could do it my way also. You could bootstrap it. But um, So was it like on yeah. principle, you didn't, you didn't feel comfortable at the time taking VC money? Um. I think it was just convenience. Like, Mm -hmm. I think it was just very easy. You know, you got a lot to do when you're trying to start a company. If someone comes to you and they say, I'll just write you a check. I, I, you know, it's very convenient. Mm -hmm. I think there's also like with families, there's a sense of like, you want to help out your family. So you think if, if I take family money from my family, um, hopefully I could turn this into a great business and I'd rather that equity be owned by, you know, a family Mm -hmm. member who I could potentially give a good return back to um, as opposed to a VC, you know? Um, So the family office invested in paper at some point? They invested at the beginning, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, quite a bit, quite a bit. Yeah. Um, You know, it got it off the ground. It it got the brand out there. People know who it was. I mean, I really knew it was hitting something where I had a friend from school who was in from Cornell tech Mm -hmm. And um, she called me up one day and she said she was on a road trip. She lives in San Francisco. She said she was on a road trip up north. She said in the car, someone in the back seat started talking about my app. Didn't bring it up. Didn't, you know, just they said there's this cool app. You can download it. It's great. You know, like that was it. That was kind of like when I started to notice, okay, this is really something. Um, The Wall Street Journal (laughs) reached out to me. They invited me down to their office. They wanted to know who I was. 
They wanted to know what my intentions were with the app. <laughs> yeah. um, it's like dating their daughter. What are your intentions? Yeah, <laughs> it, it was. It was like, it was pretty serious. Um, and they wanted to know basically if they could trust me because their logo was up there. Their content mm. was up there. Yeah. So. How did you deal with the media? Like, how did you, um, how did that work with all the copyright issues? Like, you could just use their material and distribute it? So it's a very complicated topic. I actually worked with um, a professor at Cornell. His name's uh, James Grimmelman. And uh, he actually advised me on this. And this goes back to the earliest days of the internet where there was a technology that was developed a very long time ago called RSS. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that um, you would basically be able to pull in a bunch of headlines and aggregate them into a single source um, and that would, you know, be convenient because you would have a feed of just all this information um, coming in. And that was RSS. And RSS was an open technology. It was, you know, it was, it was done by um, like an open source. It was approached in an open source kind of way. A lot of the internet is still, re still relies on RSS. Now, the thing is they put in, like if you go to the New York Times RSS feed, they'll put in at the bottom a lot of conditions. They'll say, you're not allowed to use this for commercial purposes. You're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. The thing is, the reality is most news apps these days do use RSS to aggregate the content. And most news apps do monetize the content. Apple News, Google News, Flipboard, mm. all these apps are using RSS technology to aggregate. They are putting ads in between the feeds. Um, are they linking to the media sites? They are linking okay. to. But it is kind of this very weird bully world where it's very undefined. And if the newspaper decides they don't like you or if they decide that they want to sue you or whatever it is, they would technically have a case. But they've but like at the same time, they need these news apps. So they let it go. It's a very strange gray area. I didn't like that approach. I thought it was like a like a very not sustainable doesn't it was not sustainable and i felt like it was also like bullying you know it's kind of like it's like a little bit of like a, an abusive relationship it's like i'll let this go but as soon as i'm not happy with it you know i'll kind of just pull out everything from underneath you so i reached out to my professor at cornell james grimmelman and what he told me was very smart he said you should make this app horizontal so instead of making a single feed where you aggregate all this news and you put it into a central feed he said line up the front pages and swipe um, over to get, you know, let's say from ESPN to, you know, the Wall Street Journal. And he said in between those two feeds, put an ad and you put a full page ad, number one, which looks nicer. And he said, number two, that's your real estate. No one could come after you and say, oh, that, that's my feed. No, that's not your feed. That's my feed. So that is legal, according to a lot of lawyers and, you know, some lawyers in the space. <laughs> One lawyer. Um, the one and, you paid, the lawyer you paid. That great no, I didn't. I, uh, he's, my, he's my professor, so he did it for, uh, you know. Okay. Um, yeah, shout out to Cornell. You know, good network. Um, and that that's kind of the approach we took. And so far, it's okay. But once in a while, you do get a nasty email from a, from a newspaper which says, take us, take us off. We don't want right. to be associated with this. And other times, you get an email from a great news organization like the Wall Street Journal, and they say, we love what you're doing. Keep on going. Mm -hmm. So... You know, By the way, if you if they say take us, we don't want to be associated with you. Just call them anti-Semitic. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Works for everything. <laughs> <laughs> if you do that, it'll be great. Uh, yeah. So it wasn't a smooth uh, it wasn't a smooth journey. Obviously, you're growing yeah. right now. Everything. You know, it sounds like things are going well with the app. Uh, what what happened in between? I know something happened in between. It, it wasn't exactly a smooth ride. So, so walk us through that. Yeah. Um, so first of all, this morning we started ranking again on the App Store, like like mm -hmm. I told you. So we're in the top 100 again. So that's great. At our peak, we were number eight. But there was a point in the middle. This was bad. This is in 2020, uh, COVID time, um, where I just, you know, basically I, I just got overwhelmed. It was a combination of it being like a one-man show, a lot of users, um, not no revenue, and um, the war in Ukraine. So I didn't have the stability of, you know, the team. Um, also working at nights. I want to stress that for entrepreneurs. It would have been 2022 then, right? Sorry? 2022? Uh, well, COVID was 
Oh, it's the Cold War in Ukraine started in like 2022. Oh, yeah, yeah. But we there was rumblings of it already okay, in, yeah. in 2020. Yeah, um, I, know, I know some people in Ukraine even started to leave, yeah, roughly in 20, yeah. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, you know, most of my team was in Kharkiv, actually, which mm-hmm. was one of the hardest hit cities. Um, yeah, I mean, I got, I would get Slack messages from team members, like, literally in the middle of, you know, bombardment where you know, one person in particular was panicking and uh, she really didn't know what to do. Mm. And uh, I think like single mom type of thing. And she was panicking and she messaged me on Slack in between all this asking what to do. Oh my God. And uh, a lot of our Jewish stories involve sellers in Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> right. I told her to find a seller. <laughs> uh, it's actually probably one of the safest places to be if there's bombardment. But actually, a lot of the team's gone to Poland at this point, and okay, uh, right. I think they're okay. So, but yeah, it's very sad what's going on there. They seem to be, yeah. So, um, so yeah, but in 2020, a combination of a lot of different things, um, I kind of just let the whole thing die. I stopped paying my AWS server bill and I just kind of let the app die. And I, <clears throat> You know, it was a lot of stress and um, I just didn't want to do it anymore. I just didn't want to do it anymore. So I just let it die. And I checked out from the whole thing for about a year. If you had the app on your phone and you were to open it up during that period, it just wouldn't work. Like it would just spin and that would be it. Um, And I just, I went on to other things. Like I, I, I moved to Vancouver Island for a while. I would hike. I would... I don't know. I would talk about other things. I just wanted to, you know, be someone else for a while. You know, I just wanted to, I don't know. I I wanted to learn more about crypto. I wanted to uh, spend some time with machine learning stuff. I wanted to meet people outside of tech. Um, You know, I, I just wanted to do some other stuff. So I, so I did, you know, I think when you have a good project, it's pretty hard to run away from it. So I don't even know how it happened, but somehow the app is revived. Somehow it's back on the <laughs> app store. Somehow there's, you know, a couple thousand people on it again. And, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of back in business. So, so w- yeah. what was the catalyst to like reviving it and starting it again? You know, I don't even remember it. It's almost like, it's almost like it, it just happened to me. It wasn't like I even did it. Um, Somebody paid the AW, <laughs> the server. <laughs> You know, I I uh, I had some I had some money left over. I hadn't spent all the money I I was given. Um, my AWS bill wasn't crazy, you mm-hmm. know. Um, like I don't know, it just happened. Like I remember, uh, like you know, it's such a part of me that I remember, like I don't know, like hanging out in downtown Toronto. Next thing I know, I'm hanging out with a designer. Next thing I know, we're redesigning the app. Next thing. I know I have a new developer who's like full stack and he's amazing. Next thing I know, I'm like, okay, well, we got we got a new design. I'm a design guy. I'm like, hey, we got a cool design. We got a great developer. Let's just do this thing. And also I was much more knowledgeable at that time on what it took to get these things out the door. And I'm like, it's not that hard because mm-hmm. I know so much about it. And I'm just like, all right, this is like another month or two of work. We could just get it out the door. I could sustain it, you know, it was just like very casual. It wasn't a big deal. So I was able to revive it without it taking over my life. And I was able to spend time moving into other spaces. And that was really when I started like trading and investing, working at the family office a little more. And I was able to do paper, like, you know, maybe half, half of my time. So. But uh, one thing that's interesting is that a lot of entrepreneurs, they go through a funk because the business is not doing well. I've had that myself. Yeah, I can't even describe how difficult one period of my life was so difficult. I couldn't, even, I couldn't even get up in the morning. Yeah, and it's just a combination of life being very difficult, things not going the way you think they're going to go, um, and it's just hard to do things right. So some people give up, and some people for good reasons. I, yeah. I actually think and encourage entrepreneurs sometimes. Uh, yeah, I do. The too. things are not you don't feel good because things aren't going well. That's like a natural human yeah. reaction to things. And sometimes your business is not good enough to keep going. Yeah. In your case, it's a little bit different. It sounds like you yeah. went through a funk a little bit. And I know this because we spoke about it before. Yeah. And that, but because your business was doing better, well, yeah. I just, it's, it's a very interesting, and it's not, it's not that it never happens, but I'm so curious about that. Like, how did you not, like, how did you get out of that? 
uh, funk, for example? What did you do to kind of get out of that, uh, that, that kind of... It's true. Yeah. Like, you know, I reference like the music uh, business. You know, there are some people who panic when they start to succeed. It, it, is, a, it is a real thing. Um, there's a lot of people in music who were successful and, you know, they were blowing up and everything was great. And um, I don't know if they were so comfortable with, with it, you know, mm. for whatever reason. And they just kind of, sometimes people self-sabotage. Um, you know, and, and they do it on purpose because not everyone wants to have something gigantic, you know, not everyone wants to have, um, something huge. Like, you know, sometimes they just don't. And you never really know who you are until that starts to happen, you Mm -hmm. know? Um, so, you know, um, but I, I think, I think what I would tell people is even if you are very successful, there will be a point where your life will get boring again and it will become manageable again and it will become monotonous and it will have that regularity and that stability, which you crave when you are just kind of a regular person. Even if you're very successful, you know, the higher up you go, the more successful people you meet, (laughs) (laughs) you'll still see that, that even these people, they they do have a regular cadence to their life. It might take a little bit of time to get used to it, but that, you know, they still have to make breakfast. They still have to pour the cereal into the bowl. Or they have they still to direct have to, their chef to make the breakfast. <laughs> or they have to direct the chef to do it. But there's still going to be some some monotony to it. And, you know, don't panic. You know, it will kind of, you know, level out at a certain point. And, um, but, um, yeah, you know, I mean, in my instance, I, I, just, I just panicked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting because I, you're – from everything I hear and know about you so far, you're like an artist type, right? That's yeah. the archetype that you come from. Yeah. For me, I'm not that at all. I'm more of like a business operations guy. I'm, you know, much more on the logic side of the brain than the creative side of the brain. Yeah. And not to say that artists aren't logical, all that fun stuff. But yeah. it's just a different way of viewing things, a different way of looking at the world. For yeah. me, it's just, and I, you're right, I've seen many people in that position, artists, people that are creatives, that once they experience a little bit of, um, notoriety or success, they kind of, they, they, they scale back. Yeah. Right. It's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. And uh, yeah, that's, it's very interesting. So you mentioned that you got into trading a little bit, you know, from the family office from yourself. I'm curious w- what happened. Yeah. So that, that was a very interesting twist in this whole thing. Um, you know, it, along my whole journey, again, I did have like, you know, this, like my father's story with Microsoft in the back of my head. And the main thing I was trying to remember during my whole journey was when you're in the weeds, when you're, when you're really building and you're really doing something and you're meeting all these amazing people, somewhere along the road, you are going to know something that, uh, that the general public will not know is coming. So there's going to be something that's about to hit the mainstream. There's going to be something that everyone's about to do that you might know about maybe two months or three months before everyone else does. I'm not saying like... Maybe if you're, you know, an R and D or you know, in a lab building something. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying, when you're really in a good network and you're in a good flow, you're going to become aware of of some stuff. So for me, uh, it was um, neural networks. <laughs> this is very nerdy stuff, but it was like neural networks and machine learning. Um, I became very aware that that was a coming trend. This is kind of the foundational tech which AI as we know it is now built on. But before that, it was called machine learning. <laughs> you, I mean, you, you remember these days of like machine learning stuff. According to the, the internet, yes, I do remember these things. So I'm very aware of all the technological <laughs> trends that happened before they happened. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so so I, I felt like there was this huge way of coming in of basically, it started with something very simple. Like you could show a computer um, a picture of a bird and it would be able to identify that's like a canary or that's a parrot or that's something else. And this was kind of the early days. And, um, and I was, I was spending a lot of time in neural networks and all this type of stuff. And I kind of had like this light bulb moment where I'm like this FSD stuff, this like full self-driving car stuff, it's going to happen sooner, sooner than we think. And it's going to be able to be done for pretty cheap um, it's going to be able to be done by, um, probably only one or two companies are actually going to be able to pull this off. And I think it's going to change everything. So I, um, 
I went, I went back to my father <laughs> and this is just a little side thing, a little side conversation. And I'm like, I, I think, I think Tesla is about to blow up. This was when Tesla's trading at like, I don't know, 40, 50 bucks, you know, like not a lot. This was when Tesla was being viewed as like an electric car company. And what that was, was it. the market cap roughly? I don't remember exactly. I think it was like, I don't know, maybe 40 billion, mm-hmm. something like that. So, you know, people knew about it, but it wasn't huge. Um, so I went to my father and I said, I, I, I think Tesla's about to go like crazy. And, uh, he, and, I, and I asked him for some money to put into my portfolio and to invest it. And he said, if you write me a paper, like a proper paper about why you think this is a good investment and I like it, I'll give you double what you asked for. So it's I wrote the deal. paper, <laughs> obviously. So I wrote the paper. It was a really good paper. Um, it really explained very clearly, very succinctly, you know, what I was talking about. Um, he gave me the money. I put it into a brokerage account. I invested it into Tesla. I checked out for about a year, maybe a year and a half, two years. I went to Vancouver Island. I came back. I think I had 12 x you know, my entire portfolio because every penny was put into Tesla at this point. And that was my Microsoft moment. You know, my, my father had his Microsoft moment and I had my Tesla moment. And did your father diamond hands that Microsoft investment? Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. Uh, I invested in Apple back in 2008. This was my first, like I turned 18. It was my first stock investment was yeah. in Apple. And yeah. it was a ridiculously low price back then. Cause it was also a financial crisis. Yeah. And, uh, I paper hands that man. I made like, I made like two X and I sold. I'm such a, what? I mean, you know, I, I, I learned my lesson and gone to venture capital. If I don't do hundred X, I'm not selling. Okay. I, I almost ruined it for my father where, where he was diamond handsing up till $25 a share of Microsoft. And I remember coming back from Cornell and thinking I knew everything. And I remember trying to convince him for days on end to sell his Microsoft. Mm. And this was like, was just as Satya Nadella was coming in, you oh, know, who's okay. like a superstar, <laughs> You know, and I mean, what that's what it's now. It's like 180, I think, maybe more. I don't know exactly. I don't. I don't know any Microsoft, but I mean, he he diamond hands that, and I and you know, the idea is you do diamond hands, but I actually didn't diamond hands my Tesla. I sold everything at the top, wow. Because I had a bit of a different take on the whole thing, um, which was that we actually weren't going to have a FSD right now. It was going to come a little later than expected, not too far in the future. But a little later, and I thought a lot of the hedge funds that were putting money in would lose patience and they would sell off at about 880 and they did. Um, so I got out at that point. Um, I think it's going to go higher, but I kind of moved on to, uh, so I was like, okay, well, I ha- you know, uh, time to move into something Tell else. Tell everybody on the internet, what are your financial advices for the next big thing? Okay, so so not financial advice, right. of course. <laughs> so then in two, th- so this is like again, as I'm like you can see here, like I'm getting deeper and deeper into the investing because then all of a sudden I'm like, okay, that was a great trade. You know what's kind of the next thing, and I want there was um so I had a professor in Cornell. His name was Ari Jules, and he's one of the co-founders of Chainlink. Mm-hmm. You know, Chainlink is like you know number five. And I did my thesis on Ethereum and I started to understand Ethereum. I didn't say I loved Ethereum, but I started to understand already in, in um, you know, this is 2017. I think Ethereum was trading at $25 a coin. So I, at that time was like, I like Ethereum. I like what they're doing. I like the type of people that are working in that space. Um, you know, I just hear good things and everyone I, f- I learn about who's kind of getting involved whether it's like Steve Novogratz or like Vitalik Buterin or all these type of guys, these are like, these are the guys I look up to. These are kind of like, you know, like Steve Novogratz. I'm like, that's a, that's a good guy. Like, and I'm like, I, I, I like what's going on here. And I, and I, I knew that there had to be a number two in crypto because I said, people aren't going to transact in gold and diamonds. People transact in silver. And I said, we, we need a transactional layer for this whole thing. Right, so not Bitcoin because the, Transaction costs are ridiculously high. It's low. Transaction fees are too high. Oh, so people just value it too high. Like there's a psychological aspect. It's like, you know, I'm not going to buy a a Starbucks with, you know, diamonds, right? Like it's just, it's just psychologically, it's just too, it's just too precious. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was like, okay, we we need a transactional layer. 
And transactional layers are very difficult. You know, you have to scale, you have to have enough nodes set up, you have to, you know, you have to maintain the code base, you have to have upgrades. It is very, very, very challenging to basically, you have to build like an AWS in an open source kind of way. It's a huge challenge. And, you know, I didn't really think anyone else would be able to pull it off besides for maybe one or two other blockchains that could aggregate such high level talent because there's only a few people who can do this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, I think, um, I think Ethereum has a shot at this. I'm not saying there's not going to be something else. I think there probably will be something else as well. Uh, people don't like to be forced into like one transactional layer. They're going to want, you know, maybe two or three, you know, like Visa, MasterCard, you know, you know, there's a couple of these things. There so always you give are. Us a very high level on what, how Ethereum is different than Bitcoin. Yeah, sure. So, so first of all, um, Bitcoin is what we call proof of work, which is very expensive. So, which means you have a bunch of computers all over the world, which are running 24 seven off the grid. So you got to get all that power. You got to plug in all these computers and you've got to basically do, we're basically making it up. We're making up these random challenges for the computers to uh, solve. And if you, if you solve the puzzle, you win the block. But what you're really doing is what we're trying to do is we're trying to incentivize all these computers to run. And these computers are basically recording the ledger, which means that that's the most important thing at the end of the day. It's the ledger. You have a wallet. How much money is in that wallet? Oh, here's a transaction. Okay, so some Bitcoin was moved from here to there. That's really what's most important. And we obviously want that ledger to be on like a million computers all over the world, all synced up at the same time, you know, all agreeing, you know, reaching consensus. You right. know? So if I want to pay you for my wallet, it's not just I'm confirming it. It's being confirmed by many, many thousands of other sources. Yeah. And we could go to a computer in Estonia and that computer will show that that we did this transaction or we could go to a computer in Brazil and it will show the exact same thing. It will say when it happened. And it can't be tampered because what are you going to do? You're going to hack like a million computers. Not going to happen. So that's called proof of? That's called proof of work. Right. Okay. And it's a very expensive, very high security. I mean, it's amazing how it works. Bitcoin is a beautiful, beautiful product. Um, and the work is the puzzle solving. It's the puzzle solving, right. which is really just incentivizing these people to keep, to keep the computers turned on. And we need if you're computers. doing the puzzle solving, you can actually earn Bitcoin as well, right? That's what, yes. Or, right, yes. A block. So then that's called winning the block. And you win, you win a couple blocks and, you know, it's potentially worth like a million bucks <laughs> winning the block. I don't know exactly how much you get. Um, and also it, it, the, the winnings go down every four years. That's called a halving. Mm -hmm. And basically because the idea is the price goes up and, uh, you know, if you win less Bitcoin, it's still okay because the price is going up. Um, so it's kind of the same dollar value. Right. So everything's fine. And so, so far it works. Like it works well. People are incentivized. There's Bitcoin um, farms. That's what we call them all over the world. Uh, people, I met lots of people in that business. They do well. It's profitable. It's great. Thing is, it's expensive. If I want to send you, you know, you know, 10 bucks, it's going to cost me $17 to do a transaction fee. So it doesn't make sense to send you $10. Why is it so expensive? Just because of all the computers? Yeah, I need to... you know, okay. well, there's a lot going on there. So, you know, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we need is a transactional layer. We need a transactional layer which allows us to do Bitcoin-esque transactions globally, you know, so all over the world. Uh, but we need to be able to do them for a couple cents. That's a whole different beast. So that's where Ethereum, Solana, Chainlink, the list goes on and on. But that's where, what all these guys are trying to do. They're basically trying to become the transactional layer. And they're trying to achieve what's called scalability, which basically means we could have the amount of transactional throughput that Visa has and each transaction is going to cost like, you know, a cent, maybe less than a cent. Um, I think right now, like yesterday, I did a transaction on Ethereum. It cost me, uh, I think, 40 cents mm -hmm. or it might have been a little more, 50 cents. Um, they're starting with something called L2s, which are not very elegant right now. I don't advise people to use them. There's a lot of issues with it. Those technically allow you to do transactions for a penny, or if you're using Coinbase, you could basically do it for free. So there is a lot of progress there, and we are closing in on um, like a scalable um, network, which allows you know a lot of transactions for very cheap. So why do we need? What's your problem with 
buy fiat currencies. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you an example of my of my problem with fiat. Um, so first of all, I don't have a problem with fiat. I love fiat. Like I think, um, you know, like why I, do we I, even I, need crypto? Right. So first of all, like what are, I think credit cards are incredible. You know, I, I I think they work incredibly well. I think we don't appreciate how much work was done in the '90s and 2000s to make these things really work. And I think credit cards are amazing. Where it breaks down is like. Uh, I call it international commerce, which is a huge part of our world today. We send money all over the world, and that's just the reality of how things work. And the bottom line is a lot of this is being done through wire transfers and stuff like that, which can cost $70 to do a wire transfer. I don't really have a good way to send money to China, and a lot of products come from China. Why are you sending money to China? (laughs) <laughs> I'm I'm working with the developer there. I'm working with the developer there. I'm joking. I don't really have a good way to send money to Ukraine. Mm-hmm. I don't really have a good way to um, send money to Israel. I don't really have a good way to do any of this stuff. So, you know, it's been a problem for a long time. And as someone who lives in Canada, I am fully aware of how difficult life is with, you know, working with a Canadian dollar and trying to do work, you know, outside of Canada. Like it's, it's a headache. Right. So the perfect example of this is I've been working with a developer in China. Okay. Um, how do I pay him? How do I pay him? Ethereum, mm-hmm. right? Like that's the only way to get him money. That's the only way. I I can't send him through my bank. <laughs> Don't name drop him because the authorities are. I know, <laughs> right? Don't worry. You, you'll never find him. <laughs> I can't send him money through my bank. I can't send him money through a wire transfer. The only real way to get him money is through crypto. Mm. And it's the same thing with my brother. My brother's starting a business, a uh, vending machine business, really cool business actually. Uh, everything's coming from China. Right. The only way to properly transact is through crypto. It's just the only way. And um, you know what? It works. I think this year is the first year that I'm starting to see people in the business world uh, all around the world be like, you know what? Just, just pay me in Ethereum. Just pay me in they convert it to USDT and whatever they take it out, they they do whatever they do with it. But yeah, that, that's how we transact. You know, it's interesting. In 2011, it was my final semester in undergrad, and I was in an international banking class in Sydney, Australia. It was one of the best classes I've ever taken. Cool. And I wrote a paper on digital currencies. I thought Facebook was going to be the uh, innovator in digital currencies. Uh, I still have that paper. And I'm like, oh my God, why... And I knew I was familiar with Bitcoin a little bit, right, for my research and everything. Yeah. And I didn't buy Bitcoin. I just didn't know how. I just did not know how. I was like, ah, it's so good. Like, you know, know, you really can't beat yourself up about not buying this stuff because it it was too difficult to buy for many years. And the truth is a lot of this stuff was very scammy. Still is. You have to be right. careful. Remember Mount Gox? That was like so many people yeah. got wiped out. It's Mount yeah. Gox. I mean, we just had FTX. FTX. Um. You know, even for myself, like with major investments, I don't even do it through the exchanges. I do it through ETFs. Mm-hmm. You know, Canada has some, had has had some amazing ETFs in the crypto space. Uh, there's one firm here called 3IQ, run by Fred Pai. It's a really, really good firm. Um, and they've allowed people to buy crypto through ETFs which then gives you the security that you get with buying other stocks because, you know, the CS, the Canadian Securities Commission is monitoring these companies, you know. You know, you still have to be careful. And Mm. I, you know, a lot of people saw crypto coming and didn't buy, but, you know, I I can understand it because it wasn't easy to buy. Right. I was was so philosophically aligned with the whole approach, though. I think one of the best things about cryptocurrency and why I want it to succeed is that, Fiat currencies are controlled by the central by central governments all over the world, yeah. and they're inherently inflationary. The government has an incentive yeah. to make them inflationary, so yeah. they can continue to print cash, reduce your savings and my savings, yeah. and that is not something I'm okay with. I'd rather be decentralized and non non inflationary by nature, which I think Bitcoin is. Yeah. Uh, so taking now, I, I find it very hard to believe governments will ever allow that to happen, but that is a great vision where you can like you know, take the power out of the central governments uh, so they can't inflate away your savings and purchasing power over time. Yeah, I mean, you know, inflation is obviously a big topic right now. Um, It's a very strange thing. I actually think um, 
the governments, most governments are actually anti-inflation because we have for the first time an aging population. Um, you know, life expectancy is quite high <clears throat> these days and we actually have to be for the first time very careful about inflation. Also, families don't live like they used to live 100 years ago where parents would live with kids even, you know, when they got older and mm -hmm. there were like, you know, centralized family units. People live by themselves. So people need, I think governments are very careful to not inflate away the savings of older people um, and to make sure that their money still has some buying power so that as they age and as they remain retired, um, they're, they're able to, you know, just kind of be okay um, so I well, think we're yeah. actually anti-inflationary. Uh, yeah, of yeah. course, it's very politically unwise to have high inflation, but sometimes governments can't control it because they spend too much because of their other political priorities. So they'll overspend the money that's that's going around in the economy, and that creates inflation. Yeah. But also just natural, like, they want to keep 2% inflation, most, most governments around the world, the U.S. and Canada. Yeah. And that over 40 years is going to wipe away whatever money you had, basically, right? So yeah. even that, even their own stated inflation goals is a bit problematic. But yeah. if you see what happened as a result of COVID restrictions, governments spent way too much money, which caused 40 years high, highs in inflation in Canada and the U.S., right? Yeah. Uh, we, we, I experienced that. It's like you go to the grocery store and yeah. things are twice as expensive as they were four years ago. Right. But I do think Canada is different than the U.S. in the sense that our inflation doesn't come um, from intrabank lending, which is – it's much more complicated in the in the US. They mm -hmm. have like banks and they have to have reserves and then they, you know, they borrow from each other. It's right. a it's a whole system. I think our inflation comes from the size of government. So what Canadians like to do is whenever there's a crisis, we like to expand our government. And um I think that it's a bit of a Canadian special that we have the ability to expand our government within 4 years by like 40%. Mm -hmm. And that's what creates inflation because government salaries are quite high. The average government uh, employee is making one hundred fifty thousand dollars, whereas the average Canadian is <laughs> making I don't know fifty thousand dollars. So if you increase, if you take a huge amount of the population and you give them one hundred fifty thousand dollars each, you're actually going to inflate your your economy because there's going to be tons of these mm. sleep like sleeper cells walking <laughs> around stealthily increasing the price because they can kind of afford everything. So. And you don't have to be directly employed by the government. You can be building roads for the government. You could be mm. involved with housing. You could be you could be kind of one or two degrees separated from it, and you could still be benefiting from this kind of you know huge expansion in government. I actually met with Pierre Polyev like last week, mm -hmm. and um, this was kind of like what we were discussing with some of his people. It was that you know, as an economist. You know, like I did go to business school, I took a lot of economics courses. I think as a Canadian, you have to basically say, you can't look at the American model and say that's where our inflation comes from. I, interest rates are important too, but I think it actually comes more from uh, the size of government over here. Mm -hmm. So uh, you also invest out of the family office. I'm just curious, like, uh, what does the family office do? What do they invest in? How do you look at investments from that point of view? Yeah, I mean, we do a lot. Um, we're very, tr we're very with the trends. So if the world's going towards startups, we're in startups, you know, five years ago, it was all in Canada. It was all about cannabis. So we're in cannabis, you know, um, nowadays it's a little different. Um, I would say what's going on right now is more, um, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, consolidation going on right now with a lot of firms. I'm starting to see. Very few investments being made, um, but a lot of consolidation. So a lot of networking. People are still coming into offices. You're still talking with different entre entrepreneurs, different companies, but very few checks are being written right now. Um, and I think that's just kind of the time we're in. We're in this space of like, we want to see entrepreneurs making do with what they have, you know, that type of thing. So we are involved in some companies, but very few right now. Um, and we're taking more aggressive approaches. So we're taking an activist approach. So we'll buy either the whole company mm. <laughs> or definitely a majority share. And we'll basically take it over and we'll say, we love what you're doing. We just think you can do it a little better. Uh, we'll ruffle some feathers, you know, and and then we'll, we'll, we'll try to get it in a good direction. So we're doing that right now with um, really two or three companies. And that's kind of a different approach to VC. So instead of being a passive investor and maybe, you know, 20, 30 investments a year, 
we're taking two or three and we're trying to, you know, just basically set the direction for the company. Um, and it seems to be working. It seems mm-hmm. to be working because there's a lot of great stuff that's been built, but hasn't been brought to market for whatever reason. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As we wrap up here, um, is there any advice you want to give uh, struggling entrepreneurs today? It's very hard to raise capital. As you said, uh, the economy is pretty weak uh, from all indications. What's your advice to entrepreneurs who are struggling? Yeah, my new line these days is show me $10,000. So you you got a new startup, you got something cool you're working on, that's fine. So my advice to entrepreneurs is number one, we are post pre-product investment, which means we've gone so good at, at building products and it's so easy to build products and software um, that you should be able to build it with essentially no money. Um you should be able to have a friend who knows how to program and he should be building it for you. And you should have gone in something off the ground or you should be able to do it yourself. In addition to that, you have to have made $10,000. So you don't have to be a millionaire. You don't have to be a multimillionaire. You, but you do have to show up and show me a check, which basically says I've made $10,000 off this thing I've built. Uh, it could be like a crypto uh, website, you know, like crypto news, for example. That's great. Show me some articles. Show me you've made ten thousand dollars. Fine, maybe we'll supercharge this and get it up to like a million bucks or two million bucks. But whatever product you're building, you have to show me uh, ten thousand dollars right now. That's mm-hmm. my that's my new thing. That's great. I love that. Show me ten thousand yeah. dollars. I mean, I, when I started a business after being in VC for four years, I remember I sold like one blender and I made a profit off it. Yeah. Just as an experiment, I'm like, I just made more money in, I just made more profit yeah. than all the companies in my portfolio in the, in the VC fund. Yeah. Of course, the value was smaller, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. I love that. Ten, show me ten thousand dollars. I'm going to use that. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll go five thousand. Be a bit yeah, more competitive. Yeah, five's good too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Jonathan, for joining us. We're going to leave a link to paper down below. We're going to leave links to Jonathan's socials if you want to connect with him. Uh, thank you so much, man. It was really great having you. Thanks so much, Martin. Great to see you.